All right, the book of Daniel. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you give us wisdom in this most critical book in the Bible. Help our understanding. Help us to be wise. Help us to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Daniel is a very interesting book. It's about a man without a country, a man of his times and a man for his times. God gives Daniel wisdom in a foreign land. And he turns the hearts of kings. And he also has a word for the future for God's people. And some of it is terribly frightening. Some of it is delightfully encouraging. It reads like history. It reads like drama, sprinkled with apocalyptic mysteries. We read fiction for excitement and intrigue. Why read that when you could read the book of Daniel and get all the drama and intrigue you need through God's inspired holy word? The author, though disputed by some because the book speaks in the first person and sometimes in the third person, speeches by Nebuchadnezzar, Uh, are narrated, others are recorded. Apparently, though Daniel, like Jeremiah, had a scribe, um, wrote it down, collected the things, wrote them in the book. Daniel's fingerprints are all over this book by his name, and it's estimated that Daniel at this point was about maybe 17 years old. The structure of the book is rather interesting. The book of Daniel is divided in two major sections. Most people divide it in the historical section, chapters 1 through 6, and then the prophetical section, for, uh, chapters 7 through 12. But there's something else to consider. Chapters 1 through chapter 2 in the middle of the verse is in Hebrew, and then chapter 2 in the middle of the verse all the way through chapter 7 is in Aramaic, and then it goes back to Hebrew to the end of the book. And chapters 2 and 7, which are visions pointing to the same thing, actually bracket this Aramaic section. And many believe it's because Aramaic was an international language, and so that section speaks primarily to those outside of Israel, those nations around Israel. And so the book of Daniel, like the book of Revelation, is not written in a neat chronological pattern. Instead, we find what is called recapitulation or progressive parallelism. Those are just fancy words to say repeating similar issues in different ways and generally uh, from different vantage points, sometimes adding more details as the book progresses along. What we call the genre of the book is historical and it's also apocalyptic. It's kind of like the book of Revelation. It's loaded with symbols, dreams, and visions. Jesus called Daniel a prophet in Matthew 24, 15. But Daniel is unlike the other prophets in many ways. One has said, although Daniel contains apocalyptic elements, it is not an apocalyptic book. Rather, it is a narrative that includes apocalyptic visions. And for this reason, it's interesting, the Jewish Bible does not put this book in the prophets, but it puts it in the writings. The theme of the book is obvious. God is sovereign over all who judges the wicked and delivers the faithful remnant of his chosen people. In verse 2, the word Lord is translated, um, uh, the Lord in our Bibles, it's not Yahweh, but it's Adonai, which means master or owner or ruler or sovereign one. And the entire book reflects the sovereignty of God in every hand. It works everywhere through this book. It motivates his people to trust and obey him through thick and thin. The God who controls all things works here and now, promises hope and better days to come in the future for the people of God. And though the book bears Daniel's name, it is more about God than Daniel. So and we'll also see that it points to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is the theme of all the scriptures. And, uh, and then the date of the book, if you see the first verse there, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. It has been pretty well recorded that the third year of Jehoiakim and the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar into Jerusalem, or Judah in particular, sometime in the spring of 60. Uh, 605 BC. The setting, if you want to read the next three verses of chapter 1, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, 
to the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. It was customary for foreign invaders to go in and carry off the cream of the crop first. They would be used for all kinds of services to their captors and Daniel, among other young, healthy, youthful individuals, were taken off in what is known as the, the first of the three deportations into captivity by the Babylonians. And so this sets up a very cult, uh, counter-cultural challenge for Daniel and particularly three of these youths that went with him. So we look at the historical section first, chapters one through six, and we see refusing to defile themselves. Verses five and six of chapter one, the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years and at that time, at the time of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. So the king placed Daniel and these three other youths on a three-year indoctrination course. And this is how the invader would capitalize on these captives. They requested, uh, rather than to eat the king's food, a seed-based food, um, rather than the dainties and the wine, they were allowed their diet and they fared well. And after three years of rigorous education, the king was pleased with their progress and they were ready for the king's service. And this countercultural stance sets the entire stage for the future and usefulness in the providence of God for Daniel and these three young men in this faraway land. We see in chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's interpretation. In his second year, Nebuchadnezzar has a sleepless night. He has this very dramatic dream and he calls for all his wise men. He expects them to interpret the dream by not telling them the dream, but they have to guess the dream and interpret it as well. And they kind of complain and moan and groan because it's going to be upon death if they can't interpret it. But the king says, no deal. I'm not telling you the dream. You tell it to me or you die. And so the king commands this death for the entire lot because they can't do it. And Daniel and his three companions step up to the plate. Daniel gets wind of it, sets out to pray. And Daniel goes before the king and humbly credits his God. Chapter 2, verse 28, God in heaven who reveals mysteries. So Daniel does, he realizes, I'm just a, a, a humble vessel of the of the hand of God in all that he's giving me to do in this land. And so this dream reveals four earthly kingdoms. Some interpret them a little differently, but it seems like it's Babylon, which is Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Next comes the Medo-Persia kingdom, and then the uh, kingdom of Greece under Alexander the Great, and then the the fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. And each of these kingdoms will have a temporary rule with the the Roman Empire ultimately subdued by a fifth kingdom in this vision. The messianic kingdom of Christ is represented by a stone cut out of a mountain and rolling down and crushing all the other kingdoms and filling the entire earth. And Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges Daniel's God, but at this point he shows no sign of bowing the knee. Daniel and his three friends were now elevated to higher places of authority. Chapter 3, the golden image and the fiery furnace, probably one of the best known chapters in the book of Daniel. King sets up a golden statue and demands that everyone in the land bow down and worship this image. If they do not, they'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. The word gets out by the local snitches. They hated the Jews and they tell the king and they singled out in particular Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king threatens them with a fiery death. One of the most famous responses to a threat ever made was spoken in Daniel 3, verses 16 and following. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. 
Well, there's quite a resistance there, and we know the story. They were thrown into this furnace, and the king takes a peek, and not only are they not consumed, but he notices a fourth figure in the fire with them. Verse 25, I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance <coughs> excuse me, of the fourth is like a son of the gods. And so there's a lot of speculation who this fourth figure is, but many believe it was a Christophany, an appearance of Christ there alongside of them. Speaks volumes of God's help in times of trial. So Nebuchadnezzar's response, once again, is one of amazement, but still no evidence of conversion. And then chapters 4 and 5, bringing down the mighty. Chapters 4 and 5 are the center of these bookends between chapter 2 and chapter 7, this Aramaic section. They depict the fall of two mighty men. The first is in chapter 4, and that's the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar. It is a dream time again, and it scares the wits out of the king. So once again, he calls the interpreters, including Daniel. This dream has a great tree growing up, and the tree was to be chopped down, and the stump left to remain, and Daniel interprets the dream. Nebuchadnezzar, with all of his power, will be cut down, and he will experience a season of madness reduced to a grass-eating beast. And so Daniel offers him a ray of hope. If the king will repent, that time will be cut short, and God will demonstrate mercy. And ironically, just before the madness began, this, this lunacy of Nebuchadnezzar, the king made a great boast in verse 30. Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? It's like we heard this morning about Herod as well. And while the words were still in his mouth, he was immediately reduced to a beast with a long hair and eating grass like an ox. And after a season, he was restored, and this time he appears to acknowledge God in a more serious way than ever before, giving God the glory for an everlasting kingdom whose power is unstoppable. We heard that read by Pastor Luke earlier. And then chapter 5 is the fall of Belshazzar and Babylon. This is the encounter with the writing on the wall. You fast forward several years now, Nebuchadnezzar's successor was his grandson, Belshazzar, and he should have learned something about humility from his grandfather, but he did not. And so one night he's having a drunken feast in honor of all their false gods, and they were using all the utensils that they had stolen from Jerusalem when they, when they raided it. In, the, in, in taking the captives, and in their drunken stupor this night, all of a sudden a mysterious hand appears writing on the wall, Mini, Mini, Tekel, Eupharsin. And the king's face changed color with fear. He had no clue what was going on, so he summoned his enchanters. Again, none could interpret the writing. The queen remembers Daniel, and they sought him, and Daniel was promised great gifts if he could interpret the words, but Daniel is willing to interpret the dream, but he said, keep your stuff. I don't need it, and basically, it's going to be gone anyway. It won't be around. <clears throat> First, Daniel reminds him of the humbling account of his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, and how he was brought down because of his pride. And then he interprets some of the very unhappy words that were on the wall. The writing is in the language of weights and measures. It was a word for the king, but also the entire Babylonian empire. Verses 26 through 28, this is the interpretation of the matter. Mini, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So you can see this is that second kingdom that was in that dream in chapter 2, already starting to unfold. And that very night, Shortly after Daniel was given special honors, Belshazzar was given <clears throat> his death signal. He was slain in his palace. He fell to Darius. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Daniel was given special honors that night for interpreting the dream, but that night Belshazzar was slain and the city fell to Darius. And this is a fascinating story. Darius used his nephew Cyrus in the attack on the city of Babylon. 
Historians tell us that Cyrus in turn allowed Darius to own the title of his conquest as long as he lived. <clears throat> and after Darius died, then Cyrus becomes the sole leader of the kingdom. And this is the Cyrus that Isaiah predicted by name about 150 years prior to this invasion. Now, ancient historians tell us that the city of Babylon was virtually impenetrable. It was enclosed by a 60-mile wall estimated to be over 200 feet high and 87 feet thick. It was surrounded by a moat in equal dimensions as the wall. The Euphrates River was also a huge barrier. The Babylonians had gardens and provisions they figured would last them 20 years or more. In spite of the warning, they had no fear. And Cyrus heard of the celebration of a pagan festival and planned a surprise attack that night. And while the king and his people were in this drunken stupor, Cyrus, <clears throat> according to one historian, would channel the Euphrates, which ran beneath the walls and through the city, into a 40-mile square area. This being accomplished with the lowering of the waters, the armies of Cyrus would march through the riverbed and beneath the outer walls. After the armies of Cyrus had gotten within the main walls, there were still the walls along the river which prevented their entrance into the city. In these walls were streets, where streets crossed the river were huge gates of brass which normally would have been closed and locked. But in the neglect and the spell of the celebrations, these gates had not been shut. And that's exactly how they entered into the city was through these unlocked gates that normally would have been closed and they would have not been able to get into the city. And that's exactly what, uh, uh, if you read Isaiah 45, verses 1 and 2, many believe this prophecy of Cyrus is unfolded detail by detail in the book of Isaiah. Amazing story. Uh, in the middle of the drunken revelry, the armies of Cyrus penetrated the impenetrable city and overtook it, and that very night the handwriting on the wall was fulfilled by the sovereign hand of God, and Babylon fell to the Median Persian Empire. <clears throat> and then chapter 6, the famous lion's den. During this time, Cyrus put Darius in charge. Darius also recognized the skill and wisdom of Daniel, verse 3 of chapter 6, and he planned to set him over the entire kingdom. And this made several of the other leaders jealous, and so Darius, at the request of these jealous agitators, made a decree that anyone who prayed to any other god or any other person for 30 days other than Darius himself would be thrown into the lion's den. And this is the law of the Medes and Persians. It was irrevocable. And so Daniel's regular habit was to pray openly, being a man of conviction, knowing of the decree. He was heard praying to his god three times a day, disobeying the decree of Darius. Darius had a soft spot for Daniel. He liked him. But decrees could not be altered, and so they threw Daniel into the lion's den. And the hopeful king, who liked Daniel, declared in verse 16, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And so this incident kept Darius awake that night, and the next morning he woke up and quickly went to the lion's den, peeked in to see if Daniel was okay, if his God had delivered him. And surely enough, he was elated when he discovered the mouths of the lions have been shut and uh, proceeded to put to death his entire antagonistic group uh, along with their families and the same lion, it threw him in the same lion's den and then wrote another decree declaring Daniel's God who rescued him is the living God whose kingdom will never be destroyed. Very prophetic. So that's the historical narrative section. The prophetical section is our second major point, and that's chapters 7 through 12. And the first thing we notice is the four beasts and four empires. It's very similar to chapter 2, but it's expanded. D remember, this is our other end of our bookends in Aramaic. Daniel now has his own dream, and he remembered... Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, he, he was reminded of things in this dream that were very familiar. Chapter 7 being a hinge now, continuing in Aramaic, which means we're still dealing with world leaders and empires. And so this chapter takes the dream in chapter 2 and develops it in more detail. There are four beasts again, this uh, four beasts, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a terrible unnamed fourth beast, 
all seem to be the same empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And as Daniel interprets the dream, he elaborates on this fourth beast in detail. He gives special attention to the little horn there. He develops this further in chapter 8 and even more so in chapter 11. It's hard to tell whether this little horn there is the same as the little horn that's developed in greater detail. But it's believed that the little horn depicts ruthless, arrogant rulers. Daniel 7.25, he shall speak words against this little horn. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law. This describes earthly leaders for sure and many dictators ever since. However, many believe this is a prototype of the Antichrist who wears down the saints through the ages until the end. But again, there's a fifth kingdom in this vision. And here the Ancient of Days is named, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not be destroyed. And here's the saints' hope. The saints are worn down, but the victory is not in, uh, in our lifetime, perhaps, but in the, and it's not in what we do, but it's in the one who has dominion over all the kingdoms. And John sees the same kingdom unfolding in Revelation 5. There the Antichrist and its system will appear to flourish during the ages, but there's always a greater power ruling and reigning over all. And so the Antichrist will come to an end, the Ancient of Days, Jesus, the Son of Man, spoken of by Daniel, shall indeed rule forever. Chapter 8 is the ram and the he-goat and the little horn. Here the little horn seems to represent Greece, one coming out of Greece. Daniel now has his own vision again in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. And Daniel 8 propels us into the future now. It forces us to be patient as we read through it. The culmination of the promises while living in this fallen world is not just uh, here and now. It, it's not just around the corner. These promises sometime unfold many, many years in the future. And we're to hold on, hold fast uh, to the one who holds fast to us. Daniel is told it is still a ways off in verse 17. Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. So we're propelled in the future. Verse 19 in the NIV says, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. And so the emphasis here is in the Medo-Persian and, uh, uh, and uh, the empire of the Medo-Persians and then Alexander the Great and the powerful takeover of the, of the Greeks. It's another reminder that the world kingdoms uh, the kingdoms of this world are temporary. They rise to power and then are swallowed up by another. And the cycle goes on and on. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. But the good news depicted here in this chapter, once again, is that there is one kingdom that endures forever. And the main emphasis of chapter 8 is not on the earthly kingdoms as much as zeroing in on this little horn in verses 9 and following. And that little horn appears to point to a historical figure Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes is actually the fourth one, 167 BC. This guy was, was just a, an antichrist type figure. He banned Jewish religious practices like circumcision, kosher food. <coughs> Excuse me. He stopped their sacrifices and then defiled the temple by slaughtering a pig on the altar. He made worship to honor Zeus. He burned copies of their sacred scriptures and required sacrifices to the Greek gods. He slaughtered every Jew who would not obey his commands. He was a despicable man. Chapter 11 is going to expand even further on this figure who triggered the Jewish rebellion during the intertestamental mental period that's called the Maccabean Wars. And it's good to be reminded that our ultimate warfare is not of this world, but as Paul said, it's in spiritual places against forces of spiritual darkness. Antiochus Epiphanes IV was a ruthless antichrist figure who warred not only against the saints but against heaven itself. 
He was nicknamed Ep Ep Epimanes, which means madman. He represented all rulers who have ever warred against God's people. And this vision devastated Daniel, partly because he did not fully grasp it, but also because it revealed that there would be more tribulation for the people of God, even in the long, distant future. So Daniel sets to prayer in chapter 9, and then there's a prediction. Verses 1 through 22, Daniel, you need to read this prayer. It's a great prayer, one that could be modeled by the saints. Uh, it, in reading the prophet Jeremiah, Daniel was reminded by uh, just how difficult things would become before the 70 years of Babylonian captivity ended. But Jeremiah also predicted the eventual fall of Babylon and the restoration of the holy city. And this fills Daniel with hope that after 70 years, Jerusalem will be rebuilt. But as Daniel reads Jeremiah on the new covenant, he also understands that a future time of complete restoration is coming to God's people. A new beginning when the law will be written on their hearts and there will no longer be a mixed group of believers and unbelievers, a covenant unlike the old that can never be broken. It would finally be the long-awaited time of Messiah. Daniel had hoped this time would come after the 70 years of captivity, but it would be much further in the future than that. In God's time scale, a day is a, th as a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Well, then <clears throat> chapter 9, verses 20 through 20, 20, 24 through 27, this is the prediction, the 70 weeks. And this section of Daniel is filled with interpretive difficulties, Way too much to go into here in a survey like this. But like the 70 years of present captivity, there's coming in the future a desolation of 70 weeks of years, or literally 70 sevens. In verse 24, the, uh, uh, the, the time periods in Daniel, or I'm sorry, this section tell us about the time periods uh, in Daniel, which have caused a lot of speculation. Are they literal? Are they figurative? The new numbers especially, I believe it's safest to say for the most part Daniel's numbers are figurative. The future time frame Daniel sees has six elements here. If you read it, I just summarize them to put an end to, to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit. Seal up does not mean close it, but it means to vindicate. And then the sixth thing is to anoint a most holy place or a, literally a holy one. It is believed that all of these things are references to the work of Christ on the cross. The King James Version translates verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. The Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. I should say that's the King, King James Version, not for himself. Our version says shall have nothing. Um, a little translation or interpretive issue there, but basically this entire section focuses on the future work of Christ. If you look at verse 27, it's more complicated. <clears throat> and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for a half of the week. He shall put an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Here's what we would call parallelism in contrast. Two things are apparent in this text. Jesus' sacrifice will end forever, the need for sacrifice, but it also predicts more desolation on the beloved city and the temple. Interpreting these verses will be different depending on your millennial view, but as I see it, the covenant refers to Christ and his finished work on the cross, but then there will be a final end uh, to the temple, Judaism, the old covenant, all of that took place in 70 AD. If you look at verse 26, there's a similar parallelism there. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. It speaks of the death of the Messiah, the anointed one. But the second part there speaks of one who will be responsible to dis uh, destroying the city and the temple. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And Daniel, he 
expands on this in chapter 11 and chapter 12 about the desolation, the abomination that makes desolate. Well, that language is very familiar because it's repeated by Jesus in Matthew 24, 15. He mentions the abomination of de desolation. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Now, some believe that this is stretched out to the end of time, but there are a lot of reasons to believe that this was a warning to the early disciples of Jesus and that generation that another destruction was coming to Jerusalem in the temple and the temple. And then 70 AD, that's exactly what happened. It was the last horrendous attack on the city that brought the temple and the old covenant to an end. And Jesus speaks of the future destruction of that temple in the same context in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 21, verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Seems to be the same language of Daniel, the desolation. <clears throat> In 70 AD, Titus and his armies surrounded Jerusalem and ravaged the city and destroyed the temple, just as Daniel and Jesus predicted. But all of this was only a down payment of what will happen at the end of the age. And that brings us to the latter days, chapters 10 through 12. <clears throat> chapters 10 through 12 are a unit dealing with contemporary issues all the way to the end of the ages in world history as we know it. And under the decree of Cyrus, some of the Jews returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple in the city. Ezra then later, uh, and Nehemiah also came to rebuild the walls They'd begun and then the opposition stopped it. We, we'll hear about that in the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. But Daniel, for reasons unknown, perhaps it was his age, did not return with this first wave, but he was discouraged when he heard the news and began to mourn and fast. And Daniel perhaps could not go and build, but he could build the kingdom through his fervent prayer. Daniel is engaged in a spiritual battle for the remaining chapters, but he receives a startling visit by an angelic messenger and is given a vision again from this visitor. He calls him my Lord three times in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is about wars and rumors of wars. Persia will be overthrown. Greece will ascend to power. There will be a war between Egypt and Syria. And in the midst of all of this, the people of God are once again <clears throat> tested. It's a picture of the battle of Satan and the people of God, the church. Daniel wants to know what will happen with these earthly kingdoms, Persia, Greece, and so forth. But he's given a vision of a greater battle between the city of God and the kingdom of darkness in a cosmic battle that <clears throat> these three chapters are summarized you have an outline words of encouragement in a troubled time of trouble wars and rumors of wars between nations Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth the little horn the prototype of the Antichrist the end chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 before the end the destruction of Jerusalem will foreshadow the end and before the end the defeat of Antichrist and the victory of God's people will take place. <clears throat> That's a summary of the entire book, and I want to just give you a few brief implications from the book of Daniel before we go to prayer. There are theological implications. The sovereignty of God is obviously exalted. God orchestrates providences by his sovereign hand to work his will. All the history in the book of Daniel proves that history is, as been said before, his story. Men come to power thinking it's their might and strength that got them there, but the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Daniel 1 verse 2, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand. This Hebrew word for gave is a very key word in the book of Daniel, especially in this first chapter. Verse 9, And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Verse 17, as for these four years, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. Daniel 2, 21, and he removes kings and sets up kings, and he gives wisdom to the wise. Verse 37 of chapter 2, you, O king, the king of kings, to whom God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory. And we could multiply this over and over in the book of Daniel. It is God who is the one who is ruling all things, even though we're looking through it, the lens of human history. 
But then not only the sovereignty of God, but the pride of man is brought low. <clears throat> James said, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And at the very center of the sandwich section in Aramaic, we have the fall of these two great men, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. They were humbled under the mighty hand of God. And the entire book of Daniel answers the question in Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? And so the book of Daniel teaches us that those who resist God will not survive judgment. Psalm 1, five and, verses 5 and 6 Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And then the eschatological implications. The kingdom above all kingdoms. <clears throat> and I'm out of time here, but the king's heart is like streams of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. He changes the times and the seasons. Everything in this book tells us, especially chapters 2 and chapter 7, and, the, and then ultimately the defeat of this antichrist uh, figure in the end. Uh, this stone that was cut out of the mountain will destroy all the other kingdoms. It was true then and true now and true forever. And the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man, this is all indicating that there is great hope for the kingdom of God to overrule all the kingdoms of this earth. But there's also a resurrection hope. In chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Probably the clearest Old Testament text on the hope of the resurrection. And then the Antichrist defeated, depicted in the book of Daniel as one who will wear down the saints. Antichrist always opposes the people of God, but in the end, every Antichrist in every age and ultimately the final Antichrist will be exposed and defeated by the true and living Christ. I think the Christological implications are clear. Um, he's the one walking in the midst of the fire with these three children. Uh, he's the, the son of man in chapter 7, the, the ancient of days again in chapter 7. Jesus took on this title, son of man. It was one of the most well-used uh, phrases he, he identified himself with, taken from the book of Daniel. You can read more about it in Revelation 1, 12 through 15, the description of this son of man, this great ancient of days. And then the practical implications, universal worship, the people of God are hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem with no land, no city, no temple, no sacrifices. They're without everything that was useful for religion. And we learned before that there are, uh, there are at times so discouraged, they hung their harps on the willows and they could not sing the songs of Zion. But Daniel is teaching the people of God that they can worship anywhere at any time. He's preparing the people of God to think in terms of a day when worship will not be in one place or another place, in one city or another, but anywhere and everywhere the people of God can gather and they can worship. They can worship in a foreign land and harps and lips can play and sing. This was the lesson of Jesus to the Samaritan woman in John 4. Daniel was preparing them for a day when God's people can worship not on this mountain or in Jerusalem, but wherever the church gathers. And then finally, the saints' perseverance. You read in this book that the Antichrist figure wears the people of God down. There are times of utter discouragement. There are times when it seems like there's no hope. But Jesus said all of this <clears throat> in John 16, 33, I told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And so God's sovereignty mysteriously united with the prayers of his saints brings about God's will and these young men stand as a testimony to the world. We can be countercultural, no matter what the cost. One as well said, paganism can be challenged only by men willing to be martyrs. And I would say willing to be martyrs even for the gospel's sake. Let's pray. 
Our Father and our God, we uh, submit ourselves to you in this delightful book. Much of it is mysterious, but it seems to unfold in such a positive way. Even though there are difficulties for the saints along the road, we know that ultimately your kingdom will prevail against all worldly and earthly kingdoms and kings. You are indeed, through Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. We pray in his name. Amen.